Welcome to Easel Studio, your weekly pathology broadcast news. In today's episode, we will discuss whether anticoagulation should now be broadly given to patients with cirrhosis to help improve outcome. I am Pierre Emmanuel Rotou, professor of hepatology in Hôpital Beaujon next to Paris, and this is my great pleasure to welcome Erika Villa, professor of hepatology in Modena in Italy, and Professor Patrick Nossep, who is a professor of hepatology in New York now. Uh, both have been chairs of recently published clinical, clinical practice guidelines. For Erika, it was easel, uh, clinical practice guideline on coagulation and bleeding in patients with cirrhosis published two weeks ago. And for Patrick, it was the ASLT uh, guidelines on bleeding thrombosis in patients with liver disease. So I would like to start uh, this session with a really attractive topic, which is portal vein thrombosis in patients with cirrhosis because the recently published uh, Baveno 7 guidelines change a little bit uh, the landscape and the indication of anticoagulation in this patient. And it was a little bit addressed in the guidelines you were chair of. And therefore, I would like to have Erika's view on this new uh, recommendation with anticoagulation in patients with portal vein thrombosis and cirrhosis. In other words, uh, do you think this is a good idea to anticoagulate? coagulate patients with cirrhosis and a portal vein thrombosis over uh, 50%. Erika, what do you think about, about that? Well, uh, I think that uh, mm, the recent uh, mm, guidelines indicated by Baveno come from uh, a long-standing experience now in this, uh, in this field because uh, anticoagulation, which was seen uh, with the uh, um, some kind of uh, fear in the, in the last years uh, now is uh, much more easily handled by a pathologist. And uh, uh, although um, the studies available in the field are not uh, really very, very good quality because are mostly observational and retrospective, uh, nevertheless, they uh, indicate that uh, uh, certainly anticoagulation is quite safe and uh, is followed by a low rate of bleeding and uh, mostly uh, not due to anticoagulation or to the state of the patient, but uh, uh, more to the uh, technical problems usually. And uh, uh, recanalization is uh, certainly more frequently uh, observed in anticoagulated patients. Um, what is not really uh, completely demonstrated is the advantage in survival, because uh, uh, most of the studies of the meta-analysis in the past uh, uh, have looked more to safety than, uh, than to survival. But uh, recently there was a meta-analysis presented in the ESOL last year, which uh, with the, was an individual, um, individual data meta-analysis. Yes, from that, the group of um, Agustin Abillas in Madrid. Yes, exactly. And uh, uh, this showed that uh, uh, there was uh, uh, certainly a survival advantage in anticoagulated patients who got recanalization, which is in a way uh, a chicken egg uh, question, but uh, the, 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 this finding was quite strong. So uh, I would say that uh, uh, going to Baveno, the uh, indication given by Baveno are uh, acceptable and uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, not so, um, so strong at the end, they can be accepted without too much difficulty. Yes, but um, in some way, you said that anticoagulation are uh, of some efficacy because a, a low recanalization, 70% of the patient treated with anticoagulation, uh, having portal vein thrombosis and cirrhosis, um, so get treated with anticoagulation, have recanalization. But if you do not treat some patients, significant proportion, 30, 40 percent also recanalize. So it puts also the side effects um, um, having some weight. What do you think, Patrick, about that? What is your view? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I appreciate the meta-analyses and um, the, the data that's been published. We still need more data. I don't think there's any argument about that. And a, a prospective uh, study is going to be difficult to achieve, but uh, especially given the uh, recent guidelines, but I think there's room for prospective study. Um, I think the safety 
data are reasonably clear. Um, all anticoagulants increase risk for bleeding. There's no question about that. That's one of the things that they do, and that's true in the general population. I don't think the data um, in patients with cirrhosis are particularly worrisome for an increased risk of severe bleeding. And so we're all fairly comfortable that using these drugs like we do in the general medicine patient can um, offer um, benefit without excess risk for most of the child's A and B patients. I, I do think that we have sparse data on the DOACs, um, and I know we can talk about that uh, in a few minutes, um, but I think, the question of whether we use anticoagulation to benefit survival or recanalization is, is tricky. Uh, the prospective data suggests that much of the uh, thrombosis, at least in the portal vein, uh, most of them will recanalize spontaneously. And if they don't, they're small wall adherent portal vein thromboses that really have virtually no physiologic significance. Um, there, re there really isn't a prospective study looking at progression of thrombosis. Um, so prophylaxis is one thing, but if you're treating a, an incident portal vein thrombosis, the data is very sparse on whether there actually is progression that's physiologically important. Now, um, we can, we can, Erica and I can argue about how do you define a portal vein thrombosis. And in the ASLD guidance, we talk quite a bit about the importance of uh, occlusion of the you, portal you vein. Remind the, because the SLD guidelines propose some classifications mm -hmm. that has been used as well in Baveno. Could you remind uh, our audience what is this um, uh, classification because it alludes also, uh, or it relates also to the treatment that goes with that. So Patrick, what was your suggestion in the SLD guidelines? Yeah, I think uh, we suggested that um, we classify by uh, length of time more than um, a, a, acute symptomatic, acute not symptomatic. You know, there's a lot of different categories out there. And I think um, if we know that a thrombosis has occurred within the past six months, we call that recent thrombosis. Um, and less than six months recent, more than six months, uh, not cro recent. Chronic or, chronic. Um, you know, persistent or chronic. Um, okay. Because you can have symptomatic thrombosis even with chronic disease, you can have an acute thrombosis that is not symptomatic, but that's still an acute thrombus. So the presence or absence of symptoms, I think, are is uh, can be subjective to an extent. And of course, patients presenting with severe symptoms, ischemic or otherwise, need treatment almost, you know, uh, emergently. Often. Yeah, and what so about the, the, de the degree of obstruction? We understood so this threshold six months before recent after chronic. So what about the, the level of obstruction? Yeah, I, I, when speaking of involvement in the mesenteric veins or, uh, you know, in the splenic vein, it's sort of a different uh, discussion. But in the portal vein, we, when we wrote the ASLD guidance, we picked 50% obstruction. Okay. And um, some that rationale for that, Patrick? Some rationale well, for 50% or just because it sounds good? Yeah, so I mean, if you remember Poisson's law and all of the flow limitations of a, uh, obstruction of a uh, laminar flow tube of blood, for instance, like the portal vein, um, there, there's decreased blood flow even with a small amount of obstruction. We pick 50% because um, on cross-sectional imaging, that is relatively easy for a radiologist to discern and to communicate to the clinicians taking care of the patient. So if there's 50% obstruction or greater, the radiologist can often, um, you know, can often convey that to us. I have to say it was yeah. the same limits we used in the or now old paper and on the prophylaxis because uh, uh, was uh, we wanted something was uh, important from the uh, physiological point of view. I have to say another thing which can be important for the future if planning in prospective studies. Uh, when uh, we prospectively observe a thrombus which was already 50% occlusive, very rarely it came back, almost never. The uh, so-called go 
up and down of the thrombus uh, uh, is more uh, associated with smaller thrombi. Uh, and the, yeah. so this, I think in prospective studies, this should be taken into account. That okay. the, uh, the uh, possibility of regression is for smaller thrombi, not for the big ones. You Especially agree, high Patrick? in the liver. Yes, I agree. I agree. Sorry. Um, I think, you know, those small intrahepatic, um, you know, partially thrombotic uh, um, lesions that we see a lot of are probably not physiologically important. So also in designing trials, we should avoid these, um, you know, small sections of the portal vein way up in the uh, liver. The, the fear of progression of those is low clinically, um, and they're infrequent to cause physiologic um, extension, in my opinion. Okay, I've got a very simple question for, for you too, uh, clinic, a case. A patient with cirrhosis, HIPG A, but with a contraindication to transplantation. He, you follow this patient and you observe the radio disease says 50% occlusion of the portal vein. Do you treat or do you, do you not treat? Erika? I treat him. Patrick? What I do is I, you know, I think it's easier to, um, to do these cases sort of from a theoretical standpoint, but the, re the reality in my practice is I find a thrombosis on an ultrasound typically, usually a screening ultrasound for HCC. Uh, and the ultrasonographer mentions uh, there's a thrombosis um, and we see that on the report. I always verify the ultrasonography with cross-sectional imaging of some sort. And that realistically takes a few weeks unless there's an emergency. Uh, and if it is present on the cross-sectional imaging that I obtain within two to three weeks, uh, then I treat as well, usually. Okay, so no, no controversy. Become, so it leads me to the question, how do you treat those patients now? Because, of course, we used for years a low molecular weight heparin, uh, vitamin K uh, antagonist, but now we've got this um, direct oral anticoagulant, rivaroxaban, apixaban, the vigatran. So Patrick, uh, you've got uh, quite large experience in the US with those drugs. Um, how would you manage this patient I was uh, mentioning, type A, and you find uh, uh, incidentally, as you mentioned, uh, such uh, port alveins thrombosis, 50%, and you confirm uh, this thrombosis using the cross-sectional imaging. What drug do you give? Uh, how do you follow the patient? Do you monitor that? How do you do? Yes, great. Uh Great scenario. I think the other thing I should add is I always screen these patients for varices if they haven't been screened in recent months um, or recent weeks. In fact, a new portal vein thrombosis often leads to increased varices. So another sort of built-in waiting time that I have for these folks who aren't uh, very symptomatic is I schedule them for endoscopy and screen for varices. Um, and that also, you know. And you wait for uh, varices treatment to to start on take regulation? I, I do if there are high risk varices. Um, but but, but you, Erika, do you, Erika, do you wait uh, for uh, on the No, for... we were obliged to uh, treat the varices uh, uh, by the ethical committee at the beginning of the study because they feared the, the possibility of uh, MRH. And then, uh, uh, so we uh, usually band ligated, which was something which could favor also the onset uh, of portal vein thrombosis. But at the end, after the f first five or six, we never had any problem with the, with bleeding and so on. So we stopped. So we, especially with, we are, uh, we do a low molecular weight tapering. We are quite confident that we don't uh, have many problems with it. So, yeah, so no, think, not so clear between uh, you two start or not um, the treatment of viruses. So let me give you the word again regarding the treatment of uh, this patient. Uh, so what do you give uh, her or him? Yeah, so um, after I'm certain or relatively certain there's not high risk viruses, I typically use a DOAC. In the US, the, the use of DOACs has now exceeded orphan. Um, in fact, for several years, there are more patients for cardiac indications and so forth on DOACs than there are on the vitamin K antagonists. So we have a pretty extensive experience. Um, in cirrhosis patients, we published our findings on um, a few hundred patients who have had DOAC exposure in patients with 
clinically evident, um, you know, child's A through C cirrhosis. Many of them were on for cardiac indications. Through child um, C cirrhosis. Yes, and uh, you know, you give direct to child C cirrhosis. I think the cardiologists do sometimes. Um, okay, that's uh, good. The reason, yes. that's <laughs> no, and let me inform. right. Let me make it clear. I did not prescribe all of these DOACs. Um, they were prescribed by various providers throughout the health systems, and they just happen to be patients with cirrhosis. Uh, in fact, a quite large um, uh, number of the patients on DOACs had malignancy and a DVT or a pulmonary embolism and had a very solid indication despite advanced liver disease for anticoagulation. Um, many of the patients were on them for cardiac indications. Uh, I would say the majority of patients uh, who actually received the DOACs for hepatic or you know portal vein indications um, were child's A. So the hepatologists are more careful, I think, than the non-hepatologists re related to child's A. Uh, child PU status. Uh, I use, typically we use a Pixapan um, because of um, uh, uh, twice a day dosing. And I started a low what dose. Those, uh, Pixapan, what dose, uh, Patrick? 2.5 or 5? 2.5 typically. Uh, and then I advanced to five after I see that tolerance is, is fine after several days. Um, and that's probably, um, that's probably paranoia more than it is good medical science, but uh, you know we, we are paranoid sometimes about these patients and bleeding and so forth. Okay, so um, this patient, uh, Apixaban 2.5 twice a day. Erica, how do you see the, what would you prescribe in, in these Chapuk A patients that you want to treat because uh, he or she has a portal vein thrombosis? Do you start DOACs or are you more uh, old fashioned and uh, it's not, a, not a matter of fashion, uh, of being old-fashioned. The fact is that uh, in Italy it's very, very difficult still to prescribe DOACs. And uh, we uh, succeeded in prescribing a few patients with DOACs, but because they were, they had the specific contraindication to other type of uh, anticoagulation. Uh, indeed, uh, in our CPG, uh, we have examined the thing and uh, we are not so we were not so keen on child C, child puke C, but on the other ones, uh, if available, if possible, uh, we could, uh, we could, uh, we advise to, to use uh, DOAX uh, uh, as an alternative. I would be very curious though, of oh, oh, one thing, because uh, uh, in the experience with low molecular weight heparin, uh, not every positive effect, um, could be probably uh, associated to the anticoagulant effect. And uh, one thing that I am, would be very, very curious to make a study about is whether the DOACs have the same antibacterial effect, for example, or more general effect than uh, the low molecular weight heparin cell. Because uh, um, much of the positive effect of anticoagulation uh, is not uh, uh, played by simple anticoagulation is played by other effects that they are broader and uh, uh, certainly not always uh, associated with the coagulation, but with the more general uh, condition. Therefore, to be, to know uh, whether low molecular weight heparins and dogs have the same effect on this aspect for me would be uh, extremely interesting. Mm. There are some data, to my knowledge, in, uh, for rivaroxaban in animal models, but uh, less, of course, than uh, uh, molecular wet heparin. Um, so, uh, Patrick, you mentioned apixaban. Have you, are you comfortable as well with other uh, DOACs like uh, dabigatran, uh, rivaroxaban, or have, um, have you uh, more concerns with uh, the others? Um, not, not necessarily concerns. I mean, we haven't seen excess complications with any of the different classes. Um, uh, uh, Pixaban, I like twice a day in case there is bleeding, you know, it, it's less, less half-lives to, uh, to metabolize if there is a complication. Um, you know, in patients who are on the transplant list, which do make up a, a fair amount of these patients, um, 
the reversal agents for apixaban and rivaroxaban are expensive and difficult uh, to administer and um, not highly available in the U.S. except for, you know, massive hemorrhage or intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, and so in patients who I have um, listed on the transplant list who I expect will receive offers, I often will switch them to dabigatran because of the relatively ease of use of the reversal agent for dabigatran and, um, and the wide availability. So we okay. have used all of the agents and they seem to function, you know, similarly. And uh, Erica, transplant uh, patient uh, with cirrhosis on the list for transplantation, what do you give? Well, uh, we are on, on low molecular weight heparins usually, still. Okay. Uh, and we like uh, low molecular weight more than VKAs because they Why? are more uh, plastic <laughs> in, in the management. So, um, But in, term, in terms of reversal, uh, VKA are rapidly reversed as well. You yes, but uh, uh, the, the VKAs in the advanced patient on, on list, we, we use, you know, we list patient and we transplant patient on the, uh, a um, severity score. And therefore, usually our patient have more than 22, 24 meld. So uh, we are not so confident with VKAs. I do prefer, uh, usually we do prefer low molecular weight heparin if we need it. Hmm. The, is that true that uh, the several guidelines, uh, Baveno guidelines, the ESL guidelines on the coagulation were quite uh, cautious, let's say, with uh, VKA because also of the monitoring of yeah. um, VKA in those That's patients? And, yeah, this leads me to yeah. questions uh, to Patrick. How do you monitor DOAX and in patients, or do you monitor uh, DOAX in patients uh, with uh, cirrhosis? Or do you just give the pills and that's it? Yeah, that's a great question. I was going to ask Erica just to, to circle back. Um, do you, what creatinine cutoff are you using? And as the melts rise, the creatinines rise, do you stop the low molecular weight heparin at some creatinine cutoff for your patients? Or Yes, more than creatinine filtrate, 30 ml, 30 ml. So... Would that tends to be the majority of our transplant patients uh, eventually. Um, so it's tricky. Do you have problems with adherence? Uh, our patients really don't like injecting things. Uh, well, they don't like it so much, but uh, <laughs> if uh, they understand that it's useful. For example, we didn't have, the, 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 in the study, the, the gastro study, were well, mostly child PUC patient and they got it for one year. And I, I have to say, they were very, very reliable in, in the injection. It all depends on how you explain uh, the meaning of what they are doing. Sure. And your patients with, with diabetes, don't you prescribe them insulin that is kind of injected? Without any problem, yeah. so I don't see why uh, you would have problem with the molecular weight print. It's another injection twice <laughs> a day. You know, I mean, how many injections will break the camel's back, so to speak? Um, you know, people people get tired of injecting. We we I've had problems with that in some patients, but I agree, it's uh, mostly a counseling thing. To get back to your um, to your question. Uh, we don't really monitor the DOAX. That's the joy of using the DOAX for all of us clinicians is there the monitoring we do is clinical. We, you know, we check in with them, make sure there's not clinical bleeding. We follow their, you know, CBC um, and their platelet counts just uh, as a routine, mm. um, but not, not aggressively. And, you know, an occasional patient, especially with, um, you know, with synthetic function that isn't, isn't great, will, um, their INR will climb with the DOAX. Uh, and so you do have to, um, you know, follow the INR just as a safety measure for the first, you know, first few weeks that the patients are on the medications just to make sure they're not having a, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, an increase in their INR. So, okay, um, you alluded a little bit, uh, both of you, to the other effects of uh, anticoagulation um, beyond the effect on the thrombus itself. Yeah. And of course, uh, it 
uh, alludes first to the paper published by Erika uh, already 10 years ago in gastroenterology, where uh, you tested uh, low molecular weight heparin as compared um, to no treatment in patients with HIPV, uh, mainly cirrhosis. Um, so do you think that uh, it is a drug to prevent mortality, whatever the thrombosis status in uh, patients with cirrhosis? Erika? What is your view? I've got an idea of your answer, but... Uh... Yes, <laughs> at the end of the study, actually we thought that uh, the prevention of uh, portal vein thrombosis was the least important effect because uh, it was almost expected uh, and uh, uh, as we expected it, it occurred. But what was really uh, extremely interesting was the change in many uh, of uh, some biomarkers which uh, address to different aspect of the of the old picture one was ifap uh, intestinal fatty acid body protein which is uh, a marker of intestinal ischemia the other one was uh, bacterial dna and uh, interleukin 6 which are the two phases of inflammation and uh, uh, was, this was, uh, and the other one would say D14, which is again immune activation. They all went uh, extremely uh, relevantly down during, uh, during uh, uh, treatment, and they went up again when the treatment was stopped, with the exception of interleukin 6, which was, remained very low for uh, really almost a year after, after the um, uh, stop in treatment. So uh, on the whole, I think that this is something which has to do with the improvement in the micro uh, circulation in the intestine, which prevented bacterial translocation and prevented uh, an inflammatory activation, which is uh, really very bad to occur in a cirrhotic patient, which is already which has already many, many different uh, uh, grounds for being inflamed. So I think that the, most of the positive effect of uh, anticoagulation were actually anti were coagulation independent in a way. Uh, if you want to think uh, the improvement of microcirculation, the intestine is uh, uh, independent. At the end, it was uh, in, indeed uh, it improved on the microthrombi and so on, but uh, is very indirect as an effect of anticoagulation, not as direct as uh, simply the prevention of, uh, of occurrence of thrombosis. But Erika, uh, this study dates back to uh, 2012. Uh, have you followed these patients? Uh, what is the outcome of those patients after the end of the study? Um, you, have you had the occasion to look at that? We have an update uh, uh, six years and afterwards, and it was very, very interesting because in absolute numbers, there is no difference between the two groups. But if you look uh, at the occurrence of a PVT, a survival and uh, the compensation, at the end of observation after six years, there is still a significant difference between the two groups. Okay, so it means that maybe it's not worth treating patients lifelong, but a uh, certain duration would be enough? This is what you suggest? Well, at least you could think that, that if you don't want to punch the patient for six years with, <laughs> with an injection a day, you could think that you could do alternate times. For example, one year on, one year off, something okay. like this. Because so, the, the positive effects last in the, during time. Okay, so um, we are reaching uh, slowly the end of this studio. Uh, I've got a last question for you, Patrick. After having heard Erika defending her study, after having uh, seen at ALC this meta-analysis, we were discussing previously showing a positive effect on survival uh, of uh, anticoagulants. So are you giving now anticoagulants to all your patients, whatever the, the thrombosis status, and if not, why? No, I'm not. Uh, I... I... I still have a hard time understanding, Erica, and we should perhaps debate this at Easel, um, how a year of therapy gives 10 years of benefit. Um, but, you know, I think I, I'm not the first to present the um, 
the idea that perhaps uh, a cocktail of medicines might help cirrhosis patients survive longer, beta blockers, antibiotics, anticoagulants, and perhaps a statin. Um, we're not there yet on the state of science, but I think that there is something real in the arguments that um, these medications prophylactically can help cirrhosis patients live longer. I think we need proof of that. Um, and I, I, I'm looking forward to, to the um, uh, you know, r repeating of your study, Erica, because I really like to see that in another population too. Uh, this was my desire too, but uh, so far it's been very difficult. No. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Erica. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, it was really a pleasure having you uh, and discussing uh, with you this hot topic. And now um, I would like to close this session and I would like to tell you don't miss the ne next Easel Studio where we will be discussing a recently published article and debating the classification, diagnosis and treatment of hepatic encephalopathy. And see you next Wednesday on Easel Studio. And don't forget, become a member and join Easel family.